out outstanding from the last session. So does anyone have any more questions about these three poisons before I move on to the next topic? Um, it seems to me that uh, the three poisons were, uh, were fitted to a certain mode of action. A uh, uh, what, sorry? Were fitted to fitted. a certain... Yeah, fitted. They were uh, they're very good for a certain mode of action, like more a violent action, or when you want to control someone, then you think of yourself as separate, you try to attract and uh, push, away. push away right. stuff according, because you, I think that's what it's fitted for, uh, this sort of uh, conceptualization of mm. me acting on the world and taking and uh, pushing away stuff. Yeah, so and the question so is? So what's the opposite mode of action, like what is the non-violent or the compassionate way, what mm. do you do? Because you said restrain people when they're violent or something like that. Right. So, um, and we're going to look at that, the whole process now, that's actually the next topic. Um, this three poisons, the ignorance, mm. and we identify at least three types of ignorance there, the idea that things are not changing, the idea that there's an autonomous me here somewhere, and the idea that there's this independent, objective world out there. And um, from a Buddhist perspective, the most subtle level of this ignorance is the last one, is the idea that there's a me here and an independent, objective world there. Um, and it's this seeing this separateness that leads to um, the attachment to pleasant things, the aversion to unpleasant things. And of course that attachment and aversion can operate at many levels, in very violent level or in a very subtle level. Simply having a preference over one thing over another is a subtle form of attachment. So um, this, we'll look at how this dynamic works and what we're going to see from this dynamic is that this sense of independent me, independent world is a false, is a distortion of reality. And if we can eliminate that, the, what replaces that, of course, is the understanding of interdependent me and world. And by understanding the interdependency of everything, from that, we won't have to think about being compassionate. Compassion is the natural expression of that understanding. That because of having that experience of seeing things as everything's interdependent, it wouldn't even occur to us to not be compassionate. So compassion is the action? Compassion, well, compassion is what's driving our behaviour. So if we have this interconnected understanding of everything, experientially, not just in... I mean, intellectually we may have that already, but it doesn't really affect, doesn't seem to help us much. But if we can have that experientially, then when we see someone else suffering, it's not like someone else is suffering, someone separate from me. Because now we see, oh, they're suffering, not me. Oh, that's okay. And particularly if we don't like them, oh, that, actually, that's good because I don't like them, they're suffering, that's good. If it's someone close to us, we have some, oh, I don't like that. But if it's someone we don't know, we go, oh, I don't know. And if we're someone we don't like, oh, good, actually. But if we, because we see the separateness, um, so we end up with having attachment to the people close to us and then there's aversion to the people we don't like. But if we can come to realise this interconnectedness, then when someone's suffering, then because there's no sense of separation, then the instant, the automatic aspiration is a wish for them to be free of that, which is compassion. And then we would do, that would launch into behaviour. We would do whatever we can to help that person, just automatically, because that's our, our way of, our perspective of that situation. So that's sort of the opposite. But this is what we're going to be looking at now. Action of compassion. The like, action. Like, 
stopping, for instance, someone who's harming another person, right? And stopping someone uh, and holding them down, right? That, that is some kind of... Instead of reacting with anger. But what, what, the, what, I, what I think, and maybe just tell me if I'm sure. right, um, our action can be the same manifestation, like we can do the same action out of two different kinds of... One can be out of action and compassion, one can be out of attachment. That means um, a person who is holding someone down, sure. um, it, it can be compassionate sure. and it can be from attachment. Sure. That, that's what I... Right. Think. So what I maybe didn't make so clear is that if, if that person is behaving badly and we allow anger to get involved, mm -hmm. then often the way in which we respond is we use excessive force. So yes, we're using force, but often excessive. And then the situation gets out of control. Whereas if we have the compassionate motivation, then we will not use excessive force. We'll use the minimum force necessary to restrain the person. So that's the difference. Um, coming out of the previous discussion, I was thinking that sometimes, like about the question that she asked, sometimes when you show your um, emotions or that you're angry or maybe get like got hurt, it affects the other person to realize um, that his words or actions have meaning. So I'm confused about... Uh, yes, you lost me there. Say again. Um, you said that if somebody hurts you... Verbally says something. Yeah, for example. Then only we can hurt ourselves. Because they, they actually can't hurt us. Because actually it's just some sound... It's just some sound waves hitting yeah. the eardrum. That's all they're doing. Yes, but sometimes it could be um, beneficial to show that you're hurt. To show the other person. Like I'm a teacher. I'm sure, working with sure, kids. Sure. And sometimes... The, um, the useful way for them sure. to learn sure. about your actions is what I'm saying, hey, I, I got hurt from you calling me this and this and this. Mm. And uh, so that's... It helps them to realize that I'm, I have feelings and I'm equal to them sure. and not see me as an object. Mm. So, that, so, yeah, so that's actually, that's wisdom and compassion, using wisdom and compassion to respond in that way. So even though that maybe you are not taking it personally, you can express saying, do you realize using those words is very hurtful to people? And it's not very helpful. So then you can use that, yes. As long as you don't get involved like emotionally. Well, if you get emotionally involved, you tend to overreact. Mm. And often we do is we then attack the person. Rather than emphasizing that these words that they said are very hurtful, we, we direct at the person. And then, of course, they're defensive and then it's an argument and it's out of control. So, if we can remain calm, then we can use very beneficial way of expressing to highlight to that person that these sorts of words are very hurtful words and not to use those words. Okay, and I have another question mm -hmm. um, about anger. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the causes and things to anger, but what do you do when you get angry? <laughs> and how, how wouldn't you suppress it, you know? Because sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, no, I can't get angry. It's nothing, it, it's something that I can do, but I am. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah. So what do you do when you get angry? Of course, the, the best scenario is not to get angry. Um, I mean, the trick, of course, is to catch it before you're out of control. I mean, now what happens is we get angry and we explode and do things and then later we go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And maybe we apologise and try and fix it up a little bit. But the key to change, of course, is to not allow it to get that far. And so this is something that's going to come up in this session, is not just with anger, but with any mental affliction part of any effective short-term strategy on how to deal with these things is we need to develop mindfulness. We need to become aware 
that these things are arising within us. Normally, we're not aware of anger until <laughs> it's already got hold of us and we're already out of control. So if we're already out of control, there's very little we can do at that time. Probably the most we can do is just get out of that situation because anything we do, we're out of control. <clears throat> but the trick is to, to catch it before we get to that stage. But when you say catch it, you mean to be aware of that and that's catching it? Yes. Yeah. To be aware of anger arising in our mind. Because we don't go from calm mind to 100% rage like that. I do. No, there's always a period. It may be only half a second, but there is a period of development. In some people, that development may take quite long. It may take hours in some people. In other people, it may be two or three seconds. Very quick. But there is a build-up. And so the key is to catch things in the build-up phase, because we're still in control in that period. And the only way we really can do that is with mindfulness, to become aware that things are starting to develop. You know, that there's some tension in the body, my breathing's getting a bit coarse, I'm getting a little bit agitated in the mind. If we catch that, we go, oh, hang on, what's going on here? Then we're still in control, we can do something at that time. If we don't recognise the build-up, and we've already reached a certain threshold, and we're already out of control, anger has taken control of our mind, there's very little we can do at that time. We're out of control. So again, the key to any short-term strategy is to catch the build-up, whether it's a half a second, a second, five seconds, ten, and mindfulness is one of the keys, and we're going to talk more about that shortly. The long-term strategy, of course, is to uh, overcome this fundamental ignorance, because it's only this false sense of me that actually is the cause of anger in the first place. So if we can reduce and eliminate that, then there's no basis for anger to come up. But that's long-term strategy. That's going to take a lot of work to, to get there. In the short term, we need some short-term strategies to help reduce anger. And the key with most of those strategies is mindfulness. If we have mindfulness, and catch it, then we can start to do things in that state. We're still in control. So that's the key. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do now, and we're going to use your handout for this, is this Suffering and Its Causes handout that you've all got. Um, what we've said is that in these Four Noble Truths, in the first two Noble Truths, the first Noble Truth of, of Dukkha, is the state we find ourselves in now. Why are we stuck in that state? The second noble truth is saying it's because of our mental afflictions and our actions that are driven from those mental afflictions. That's what's resulting in our current state of dukkha or suffering. So what I'd like to do now is have a look at how that process works. And that's described in the suffering and its causes chart there. So the first step in the process is what's called seed of ignorance. And here, ignorance is the ignorance within the three poisons. And I specifically want to talk about the deepest level of ignorance. And that is grasping on to independent me, independent objective world. And seed of ignorance, seed here means habit. So we have the habit of believing that there is a me here and an objective world there. And according to Buddhism, we've had that habit since we were born and well before that. Now, every time when we look out on the world, everything that we see appears to exist completely independent of us. But the Buddhist view of reality is saying... <coughs> Things are not existing as they appear. That these appearances are deceiving us. Even though things appear to be exist independent of us, they do not exist in that way. So, this appearance we are receiving is deceiving us. It's what's called mistaken dualistic appearance. The 
that everything mistakenly appears to exist independent. Duality, of course, subject-object duality. There seems to be me here, objective world there. So this appearance, everything appears to exist independent of us, and the Buddhist view is saying this is a mistaken appearance, that things do not exist in this way. Now, because everything appears to us in this way, and we have the habit of believing these appearances, and we've never seen things in any other way, then there's no reason to question these appearances. So we just automatically accept them. Yes, this laptop is in existing independent of me. And that's step two. That we automatically accept these appearances. There's no reason to question them because we've never seen things in any other way. And if we ask anyone else, everyone else will say, yeah, that laptop appears to exist independent of me as well. So we just accept it. We accept it. Now, in every one of our experiences, you know, we talked about briefly these mental factors that we have in our experience. 51 mental factors. One mental factor that's always present in every single experience is this mental factor of feeling. So again, this word feeling here is this mental factor of feeling which experiences things as either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And of course, neutral just simply means neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Now, let's say, for example, uh, we're looking at these flowers here. Those flowers appear to exist independent of us. We have the habit of believing that. So we just automatically accept, yep, those flowers are existing independent of me. And let's say when we look at these flowers, we have a pleasant experience. That pleasant experience, together with the belief that those flowers are existing independent of us, will lead us to naturally assume there must be some attractive quality there that's causing my pleasant feeling. So we'll see these flowers as inherently attractive. And from a Buddhist perspective, this is a misconception. Or, if I look at these flowers and I'm having an unpleasant experience, that, together with the belief that these flowers exist independent of me, will naturally lead me to assume there must be some unattractive quality there that's causing my unpleasant experience. We'll see these as inherently unattractive. Or if we're having a neutral experience, that will naturally lead us to assume there must be some neutral qualities there causing my neutral experience, inherently neutral. So once we've got to this third step, the fourth step easily <coughs> follows. Because let's say again I'm having a pleasant experience when I see these flowers and I'm mistakenly seeing them as inherently attractive. Now, I like pleasant experiences. I want pleasant experiences. Those flowers seem to be causing my pleasant experience. I want those flowers. That's attachment. Or, if I'm having an unpleasant experience, I don't like unpleasant experiences. I don't want unpleasant experiences. Those flowers seem to be causing my unpleasant experience. Get them out of here. Aversion.
or if I'm having a neutral experience, all that that will do is reinforce my false belief that those flowers are existing independent of me, which of course is ignorance. But often here, instead of the word ignorance, you'll see the word confusion. But this is not a confusion of, are these flowers or not? This is confused about how they exist. So this word confusion is just another word for ignorance. So these, as we see then, are the three poisons. And this is then leading to the other mental afflictions. And this is what's driving our behaviour. And the Buddhist assertion is that every time we have, we do a certain action, motivated by these mental afflictions, those actions have a result. And the results of those actions are our experiences. And collectively, all of our experiences, of course, are described by the Buddha using the word dukkha. <clears throat> So this is how the first two Noble Truths work. So um, in terms of, the, this is the first Noble Truth. And this is the second Noble Truth. And within that, this is the uh, mental afflictions. And of course, action. So this is how the first two Noble Truths work together. That driven by our mental afflictions, particularly from ignorance leading to the other mental afflictions, that's driving our behaviour and that's resulting in all of our experiences. Any questions about this? It's just another word for ignorance here. So, um, if we're having a neutral experience, mm -hmm. then that's simply going to reinforce that this object is existing independent of us. That's all. So, it's just reinforcing ignorance. But often here, in this process, they put, use the word confusion. It's just another word for ignorance. That's all. And, and neutral feeling can harm? Can harm. I mean, generally, the it's the pleasant and unpleasant experiences that often lead to more direct reactions. Um, but, of course, at least the neutral experiences are simply reinforcing our ignorance. And they may not directly, immediately lead to some sort of reaction. That's true. But at least they're still reinforcing ignorance. Yeah. Um, I don't really understand your example with the flowers. Okay. Because you said that they're um, separate from you, right? That, that there's the object of flowers, which is just flowers, and, the, and that's, uh, that, that's a wrong view, but I don't understand why. Okay. So, to us now, there appears to be a me here, an objective world out there, independent of us. And we believe that. Mm. What we're saying here is that this is a false view of reality. That things are not as they appear. See, even in Buddhism, we have a number of philosophical schools within Buddhism. And... We talk about four main philosophical schools. And the two lower philosophical schools actually say there is an objective world. No problem. That things do exist as they appear. No problem. What these schools say is what the problem is, is only how we see ourselves. We believe there's this autonomous self. You know, I talked about this briefly before. They say the problem is Believing there's an autonomous self here. There's this solid me here. That's the problem. 
the, the two higher philosophical schools say that's a problem, but there's a deeper problem in that how the world appears to us is not how it exists. That the way the world appears to us is deceiving us. And so that's what we're talking about here. According to these higher schools, particularly the highest school, which, which we're looking at here, yeah. is that these appearances that we receive are mistaken. Meaning, things do appear to exist independent of us, but that's not how they exist. So that's how, what's mistaken dualistic appearance. How do they exist? Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, the the oh, short yeah. answer, the short answer, um, and we're going to look at this on Saturday more, we're going to talk about the Vipassana practice, which deals with this point. The very short answer is that there's no independent me in world because there's a dependent me in world. Everything's interdependent. That's the short answer. Everything is in a relationship with everything? Mm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, that everything has like a connection with everything? And not... Well, that sounds a bit awkward. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. Okay. What I'm suggesting is nothing exists independently. For example, a very simple thing is... A simple answer is, or to, to answer it, is this big? Sorry? Is it big? Different. Big. Okay. Is it it's big? big. So, uh, well, it depends. <laughs> so you can't have big on its own, can you? Okay. You can only have big relative to small. Yeah. You can't have big and small. Okay? okay? Just like that, you can't have up without down, in without out. Just like that, you can't have me without not me. What the not me is could be you, the world, or in other words, no, you can't have subject without object. You can't have experience-er without experienced. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the interdependent world. Intellectually, it sort of makes sense, maybe, but is that how we instinctively see the world in our behaviour? I just don't, don't understand what we're supposed to see. <laughs> I understand what we see, it's very familiar, but I don't understand if it's not really the way it is, then what, how So, we we're not it? saying how that, we we're not that? saying that somehow if we get it right, we won't see a pen here. Okay. We're not talking about some alternate reality. Okay. What we're talking about is, are we seeing this pen in a correct way or not? Not whether or not there's a pen here. That's never the question. Okay. It's not like we're going to end up in some alternate reality where there's no pens. Okay. We're not talking about that. Yeah, that's what I thought. No. Okay. We're sort of talking about now, when we see this pen, we experience it as if it was it existed independent of us. That's how we experience it, no? And then we have like a, a feeling towards it, if it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And the pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling in itself is not a problem. Yeah. The problem is having that together with the belief that that pen is independent of us. That's the problem. That leads to the problems. So the question is, is this pen really independent of us or not? That's what we need to investigate. And the Buddhist assertion is, it's not. And if we realise that, even if we have pleasant, unpleasant experiences, you can never develop attachment or aversion. That's the Buddhist assertion. We're going to look at that in more detail later. Okay, and do we still have feelings after all that? Or, or is sure, but we never have reactions. We have never had mental afflictions. Because that's what leads to suffering. Pleasant and unpleasant feelings itself is not suffering. It's what we do with them that causes suffering. This is what leads to suffering. If we get rid of that, then pleasant, unpleasant, okay, no problem, no big deal. You said that uh, uh, bonding between mother and child is, is good in Buddhism. Sure. And from what I see now is um, a, a mother needs to exaggerate the attractiveness of her baby. <laughs> That's and, healthy? And yeah, I think. Wait, I think it's, um, it's necessary in the beginning. And also the, the baby 
Why is it necessary? Because, because you know, children think uh, if their, their parents are, the, are they exaggerate their um, qualities and the, why is it necessary? Because it's necessary for them to, um, to be attached to their parents more than to strangers. And and uh, and also a mother, it's good for her to love her son more than she loves the neighbor's son, right? Why? <laughs> why? 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 Because uh, I don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, of course, it's it's uh, important that in some level we develop this reality understanding. But it's also necessary. Uh, in the beginning of something, that we have like a um, misleading conception because this is what <laughs> makes this bonding good. No, <laughs> the Buddhist assertion, the Buddhist assertion is that if we exaggerate, it interferes with the bonding so, and it makes the bond uh, destroyed. So a mother doesn't exaggerate her son's, um, her baby's uh, qualities. No, because if we do that then, like you said, if you say to your child, you're special, you're special. No, but not, okay, like a baby, you know, I want to touch him more than I want to touch this. Uh, As baby. a mother, of course, you, we have certain responsibilities to that child that we don't have of other but children. it's not from the head. <laughs> right. And if we can, if we can, from the heart, do this bonding in a good way, then that child will develop in a good way. If from the heart we allow mental afflictions to come in, that bonding will become dysfunctional and it will interfere with that child's development. So what I'm suggesting is to develop strong bonding, we need to try to reduce attachment and aversion and to do it with a pure heart, with pure loving kindness and compassion. Then there's a better chance that that child will develop in a good way. And a better, a stronger bond will form. Okay, this is, makes sense because she's grown up. But if you look from the side of the baby, and he doesn't have all of this intellectual understanding. He doesn't need it. Okay, so of course he, he thinks of his parents as the best. Right. And if and the mother is, is radiating compassion to the child, that's going to be much better for the child's development than if the mother is radiating attachment. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about is radiating, having a positive influence on the child as best we can. And what we're saying is that these mental afflictions interfere with that positive connection. I agree that this is the spiritual work. No, it's nothing to do with spiritual. It's nothing to do with spiritual. What do you mean? It's just common sense. <laughs> yes, but sense is spirit. Common sense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, so what I'm saying is that, yes, the mother needs to do everything they can to develop a healthy, strong bond. If the mother allows mental afflictions to come in, that will interfere with that process. That's all. That's all we're saying. I wanted to ask, uh, concerning what you said, is your love of the mother it's, uh, an attachment? Mother to a, a mother to mother to her son. The reality is, we are pervaded by attachment. The reality is, for any one of us to do any action with zero attachment would be impossible. Impossible. What we are trying to do is see attachment when it arises and try to reduce it as much as possible. If we only do actions when there's no attachment, we would never do anything. It, it would be impossible. So, therefore, in our actions, whether it's to a child or another person, we're trying to do those through loving kindness and compassion as much as we can. And to notice if attachment is starting to creep into our motivation. And if it is, to see that and try to reduce that attachment as much as possible. Because that attachment is going to interfere with a healthy relationship. 
with us and anyone, child, neighbour, partner, whoever. So this is what we're trying to do. So the reality is, of course, whether it's a mother or anyone, um, attachment will be there. The, the goal is, at our level, is to notice when it's coming in and try to reduce it as much as possible. That's all we can do at the moment. The long-term strategy is to get rid of attachment altogether. But that's long-term. Short-term, notice it and try to reduce it as much as possible. That's... Is the feeling of love, this is an attachment? No. Okay. So, again, for us, love and attachment are mixed together. For us, there seems to be one thing going on. And so, then if Buddhism says to get rid of attachment, it seems like we're getting rid of love. But what we're saying is that in that one thing, there's actually two aspects going on. One's very healthy, the love is very healthy, the attachment is very destructive. We are to identify these two elements and increase the love part and decrease the attachment part as much as we can. That's all. Fear is also something that uh, is connected with the ignorance? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. From uh, my ignorant point of view, <laughs> I see Buddha as their monks and they don't work. They, they don't have a job and they don't have a family. Sorry, the best the monks. The best Buddhas, right? The, no, the, no. The monks? I mean, you see the, I don't know, the Dalai Lama and other Buddhas, usually they live in like, you know, monasteries, they're monks, they don't have relationships, they don't have families, mm -hmm. they're not scientists, doctors, and Buddhists. Mm -hmm. And the question so is? How do you, com I mean, do you, in order to be a good Buddhist, is it difficult to have a family and a job? And <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, of course, the reality a thousand years ago in ancient India and Tibet is people struggled to survive hard life. Um, and if you wanted to entertain any sort of spiritual life to get teachings and meditate and that, almost impossible to do that in a normal life. One is you had no access to anything, and two, you were struggling to stay alive. So the only way in, historically that you could really do anything was to become a monk or a nun, to go to monastery or nunnery. You get a uh, roof over your head, you get educated, you can meditate and so forth. Of course, things are very different in our modern society. So do you have to be a monk or a nun to be a good Buddhist? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, being a monk or a nun is just one of many ways of following the Buddhist path. Many ways you can follow the Buddhist path. Particularly in our modern society where we've got lots of opportunity, which often didn't exist a thousand years ago. Um, and what we need to understand, of course, is then people often say, oh, but they're not helping society, they're just sitting in a cave for ten years. Um, what we need to understand, of course, is that there's a balance that we are trying to develop ourselves, and we're trying to help others. So we need to do both. And developing ourselves is a lot of inner work. So often that can be very effective to withdraw for a time to develop ourselves, and then we can come out and help. Like the, the example I often give is, let's say we want to go and heal the world. So immediately we can rush out and do what we can and put bandages on people and so forth. Or we may decide it's better to go off to medical school for six years and during that time we're not really helping much in the world. So we're withdrawing from the world, going to medical college to become a doctor and then we go out and help people with more qualifications and we can be more effective. So is it best to go out straight away and help or is it best to go away for six years to become a doctor? For some people, the doctor option is the best. For others, maybe not. So we as an individual have to see what are, are our talents, what would work best for us. And we need that balance. We need time to develop ourselves, and then time to help the world. So this is the balance that we're trying to get. 
And we can do that in any one of many different ways. So for some few people, maybe, becoming a monk or nun may be the best way. For most of us, it's probably not going to be the best way because of cultural and environmental conditions now have changed dramatically. So being a monk or nun in the modern society doesn't offer a lot of the benefits that it did a thousand years ago. So for the vast majority of us, that definitely would not be the best way to do it. Some people, it might still be the best way. So then we pick the way which we move forward. And as we're going to see, um, starting tomorrow, when we look at the Lam Rim, we talk about the Mahayana, we talk about achieving enlightenment. The purpose is to benefit others. One, and, and in that path, we talk about the Bodhisattva, the person who really is striving for enlightenment to benefit others. One of the best mechanisms to do that is family life family life. I mean, who is, I mean, you've readily made, day in, day out, you've got people there dependent on you that you work with, your children, your partner. So fantastic to have a family life, to have that opportunity. So we, as an individual, look at what vehicle or which way would work best for us. So, you know, what is the, which is the best tradition or the best system is the one that works best for you. So what works best for you may not be the best for another person. So we as an individual can see that and then adopt a, a mechanism, a way of pro progressing that works best for us. And it may be to have a large family. That might be the best for us. So there's no right or wrong or if you want to be a good Buddhist, you have to give up the family and, and go and live in a cave and become a monk or nun. That's completely not true. A thousand years ago it may have been true because of the conditions. You didn't have any possibility otherwise. But now we've got many options. Does that sort of help? Uh, kind of. Oh. Is there something because, else? Uh, I mean, it's, it's like they take the easy way. So if you don't Ooh, have being a monk and nun is not easy. No, I mean that <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's easier... It's easier not to have a partner than oh, to, have no, a, no, no. <laughs> to have a partner and struggle with attachment or loving him directly oh. without attachment. I, I don't think that's necessarily so let's true. Let's not have a spouse altogether, then I don't have to struggle with that. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's. I, I think that that's not the easy way. I mean, I think whatever way we choose, there are many challenges, and I think it's then we just use one that we resonate with and that is most meaningful to us, that's all. I think there's no easy way. I know it's not easy, but I'm, yeah. that's what I'm... Yeah, but of course you're right. We may think, oh, having a partner, oh, a lot of attachments and problems, I'm going to back out and I'm going to run away and hide in a cave. That might be easy, but are we going to develop as a person? No, we're going to stagnate. It's not, yes, it's easy because we don't have to deal with things, but we're not going to progress, we're not going to develop as a person if we take the easy option in that sense. So that's not <laughs> what we would want to be trying to do. Of course, some people do that. They run away and hide, but I mean, that's not a Buddhist path. Um, when you say it's, when you said before that it's not possible for us to be without attachment, like in, in the short term. In the short term, yeah. Did you mean? Did you mean especially like? Um, did you mean people in general, like the human kind, or did you mean like the modern society or the Western society? Oh, I mean, even. <laughs> I mean, in Buddhism, this world we live in, um, when we go into Buddhist cosmology, um, this is often called the desire realm. Because the main driving factor is desire, is de attachment. And even back in the 4th century, great Tibet Indian master Vasubandhu was commenting on this in the 4th century. He said, why is it called the desire realm? Because we have two main driving desires. What are they? The main desires. Two. Two of what you Two, our two main attachments or desires. Two main attachments? Yeah, in, in general. Um, 
what would you think they would be now? Now? Um, no. I think being in like relationships, anything, like friends or... Well, I think more primal than that. <laughs> well, and just like food and... and um... Sex? Yeah. That's exactly what Vasubandhu said in the 4th century. <laughs> the two main driving forces in our life is food and sex. I think not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. <laughs> so I think it applies 2,000 years ago as well. <laughs> okay. What I'd like to do now then um, is that what we can see from this is that to overcome this, we need to go back to the source. So, to overcome this type of existence we have, to be liberated from suffering, we need to get rid of the underlying source, ignorance. So, the long-term strategy is to eliminate this. And to eliminate this, we need wisdom. The, what's called the Vipassana practice. To come to realise the nature of reality. And we're going to look at this practice um, on Saturday morning. So that's the long-term strategy. Now, that may take a little bit of time before we get that far. So it would be helpful to have an effective short-term strategy in the meantime, while we're working on that. And effective short-term strategy to try to reduce the impact of this process. So what I'd like to do now is have a look at some effective short-term strategies. What can we do right now to reduce the impact of this process? So I'd like to look at each step and see what can we do now to stop going to the next step. So let's say we're at step one. That is, we are coming into contact with something. It's appearing to exist independent of us. We have the habit of believing that. Is there anything we can do here to avoid automatically accepting or believing? Now. Anything we can do now? We can investigate. How? You, yeah, that's the right answer. Um, but to investigate this, we need to already have been starting to do this. Because we need to have already some idea of what is the nature of reality. And if we have that, then in our daily life, when things appear to us in this way, we can go, hang on, through my understanding and experience here, I know things are not as they appear. And then we can try to reduce this a little bit. One thing I wanted to mention here, actually it's prior to this step, and that is that, anyway, I won't put it in, but, um, now there may be certain objects, and those objects can be people as well, that whenever we come into contact with them, they always overwhelm us in a negative way. Maybe there's certain people, certain things, whenever we meet these people or things, we have strong rage, strong craving, and we just get overwhelmed. So an effective short-term strategy could be for those few things that always overwhelm us in a negative way, maybe we need to give ourselves a little bit of space from them. Of course, running away from them is never a long-term solution, but it could be an effective short-term strategy. Give yourself a bit of space from that particular person, that particular thing, so that we're not overwhelmed, because that's just increasing our negative habits. Give yourself a bit of space and work on yourself, so that later, when you're more strong and stable, less reactive, you can interact with that person or thing and not be overwhelmed. So there may be a few cases like that in your life where the best short-term strategy, give yourself some space. Unfortunately, often those very people are relatives. 
and it's difficult to get some space. And of course, when they're people, we're not talking about cutting from the people. So we keep them close to our heart, but maybe give yourself a bit of physical distance from them, if you can. So that's something we can do even before the first step. But let's say we've got to the second step. Now we are believing or instinctively seeing that person or thing as existing independent of us. And we're having a pleasant, unpleasant or neutral feeling or experience arising. What can we do at step two to avoid going to step three and four? Following what? Well, the, the feelings that we have towards it. If we have like a pleasant feeling towards it. So how, in a practical way, what are we, going, what are we to do? Maybe we think so that let's say a pleasant feeling comes up, then what do we do? In a practical sense. Not reacting. Not reacting just how? Mindfulness. 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 We acknowledge that we yeah. that we exactly, mindfulness. So if we have an experience and we have this pleasant, unpleasant, or even neutral, particularly pleasant, unpleasant, feeling coming up, then with mindfulness we simply observe that. And if we can observe that pleasant or unpleasant experience, we can really very effectively cut this process. And what you'll find is in many Buddhist traditions, particularly the Theravada traditions, they put a lot of emphasis here. Because this is a very practical point to break or at least reduce the impact of the process. So if we can really develop mindfulness through the shamatha practice, then what we'll notice is that in daily life, with that mindfulness, we'll notice that pleasant or unpleasant feeling or sensation coming up, and we'll just observe it arise and pass. And what you'll find is that it becomes a more an automatic thing. It's not like you have to really think about it. But because of your training in mindfulness, then you'll start to notice, like what you'll notice is that, for example, small things that used to sort of irritate you before, all of a sudden you'll go, oh, that's not irritating me anymore. What's, what's going on? What's going on is some little bit of unpleasant feeling is coming up and you're just noticing that and because you're noticing it, you're not getting caught up in it, so it's got nowhere to go. So it'll just come up and pass. It'll come up and pass. What happens now, of course, is we don't notice it. It comes up, we latch onto it and we go from agitation to disturbance to irritation to anger and so forth. So, this is a very effective point in this whole process. And, uh, again, a lot of the Theravada traditions put a lot of emphasis um, at this point. Sorry, can you define mindfulness? Yeah. So, mindfulness... is coming from the Sanskrit word smirti and the Pali word sati. Both of these words literally mean to remember. So mindfulness is simply remembering the object. <coughs> so mindfulness is simply our ability to hold or focus on an object without becoming distracted. So this is mindfulness. And this is the main tool we use in the shamatha practice, in the stabilizing meditation. In that meditation, we are strengthening our faculty of mindfulness so that in daily life, we can apply this mindfulness in many areas. Mindfulness, it's not awareness, it's not the same thing? Um, so, again, the word awareness is used by many different translators in many different ways. Um, generally, awareness just means mind. Sometimes people use the word awareness. See, together with mindfulness, there's another tool we use in the shamatha practice. So mindfulness is our ability to hold the object. But then we need quality control. We need to monitor that. 
how is the mindfulness going? Are we still on the object or are we becoming dull or distracted? So that quality control, that faculty, normally is called introspection. Introspect to monitor. Sometimes translators call that awareness. So the word awareness 